Hello and welcome. This is March 11th, 2021. This is the a joint meeting with the House Education and House Ways and Means Committee. And today we are looking at uh, a variety of issues related to education funding and impact. Uh, I wanted to start first and uh, welcome to uh, the Ways and Means members and to Chair Janet Ansel for um, joining us today. And did you want to say anything, Representative Ansel, or no? Uh, <laughs> thank you for having us. Um, we, as, as people know, we acted on the yield bill early, early in the session to give a signal to the field about you know, the improved revenue situation. So uh, you have the bill. We, we're definitely interested in it. And um, the information, as I understand it, that we're going to talk this morning is um, going to help us better figure out how to move forward. I realize that we won't get the balance sheet until later, but, um, but the, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate being here. Thank you. And there's a possibility that that may be ready tomorrow. And if not, then we'll get to it early next week. Okay, good. So today then I'd like to start with uh, Sue Saglowski from the Vermont School Boards Association to give us an update on uh, our school budgets following town meeting. So welcome. Good morning, Sue. everyone. Thank you very much. And I'd like to start by thanking the Ways and Means Committee for its early action on the yield bill because we think that had a role in the positive results that I am about to provide to you. The unofficial results that we have through town meeting day are that um, there were 94 budgets voted on town meeting day. There was one that was voted before town meeting day. And of those 92 were approved and three were defeated. There are 20 budgets that are um, waiting to be voted at a later date. And the information I have for you as to the, those that were defeated, um, it was Barry Unified Union School District um, the Georgia School District in Franklin West Supervisory Union and Wolcott School District in the Orleans Southwest Supervisory Union. And I've provided to you in my written testimony a list of the districts that are voting at a later date. And if we have the exact um, date they're voting, that's included in there as well. Um, and that is the information that I have for you this morning. Um, hopefully, Hopefully uh, your, my written testimony has been received so that you can see it on your website soon. Sorry, it was sent in later than usual. Thank you. I, I don't see it, but I just wanna um, see if there are any questions then for the school boards. Okay, thank you. Um, we can then move on to Brad James who's gonna help us uh, understand um, the uh, federal funds that are coming to our school districts based on, uh, I think it's three different titles, federal titles, as well as uh, ESSER funds, CRF funds, and um, I don't, you were doing the gear funds. I did, I did not add the gear funds in there right. uh, because they, initially they went to the, the uh, technical centers right. and I'm not sure what's happening with the second round of gear funds right now. So this is ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and CRF in, in terms of the one-time funds. Thank you. So welcome. Thank you. Um, Brad James, Agency of Education for the record. Um, what I was asked to do is kind of compile data and then look at it on a, and then uh, put it out there on a, on a per pupil basis uh, along with some other information. And um, so what I looked at were three of the major titles that, that we received were Title I, uh, Part A, Title IIA, and, and Title IV. Um, I sent a, a, uh, a handout, it, it looks like this. It's a kind of just a brief overview of what the, in, each individual title does. Um, title A is improves academic achievement for the disadvantaged kids. Um, it's money that is sent to the federal government to um, provide opportunities for those children who are disadvantaged. It's based on poverty counts from the U.S. Census. Um, Title II A is supports effective instruction, and that's also used to increase achievements, um, improve the quality and effectiveness of teachers, principals, et cetera, um, increase the numbers too, and provide 
low-income and minority students greater access to those teachers. So it gets money that's directed towards those those kids who struggle a little bit more. And then Title Park. Title IV um, is student support and academic enrichment. And I have to read this one because I don't really know what it is. Um, it provides funds to improve students' academic achievement by increasing the capacity of states and local education to provide all students with an access, all students with an access to well-rounded education, improve school conditions for student learning, and the, improve the use of technology. So they're all they're all kind of, you know, we're obviously working to get um, get kids to do better. Title, the federal title monies are meant to su supplement state money. They are not meant to supplant state money. So they can't be used in place of state money. They have to be used on top of state money. The, just to kind of make a quick jump to the, um, the relief monies that came out of the CARES Act, the CRSA Act, um, the, the CRF money, coronavirus relief funds, the ESSER monies, ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, which is Education and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds, if I recall the acronym correctly, um, those do not have a supplement versus supplant restriction on them like the titles do. So they, so you can use those in place of state money if, if it, it's allowed by the federal folks. So what I did on this handout um, is I compiled the, the three titles that we're talking about. There are other titles too. We get title three, which is goes for ELL kids, English language learners. Um, and a couple of, I can't remember what title five, but I think we get, I'm not sure if we get money for that one or not, but I did not include those in there because they're not necessary to everybody. So, but the, the three that we're talking about, one, two, and four kind of go to all, all school, school districts. In Vermont, because Vermont is so small, um, our school districts are small, we have got made a, made a, an agreement with the federal government that our local education agencies are not the school districts, but are acts as supervisory unions or supervisory districts, as the case may be. So that's that's really the level we're talking about. We're up one notch from the school district level. Um, so when we combine on, on this sheet now, when we combine the three titles together, it's a, it's about forty nine point seven million roughly right around that much money. Um, I then took those dollars, I added, again, I added them up by SU. I then took those dollars, those dollars and divided them by the actual fiscal year 21 average daily membership count. This is the count that you pat, that you held harmless at the end of the session, at the end of, I guess I should say spring last year when you said that the count used for the equalized pupils will be no less than the FY20 count. But with the numbers that are on this sheet in the third to the last column, where it says FY21 ADM, those are the real counts that came in. Those numbers are down roughly 4,400 from FY20. Largely, a uh, big piece of that is because pre-K kids did not were not sent to schools. So that's accounted for about 1,700. And then the roughly 2,700 others, I think there's a lot of homeschooling going on from what I've heard. There was some increase in some private schools, but I think it was largely homeschooling. My guess is, and I don't know this for a fact, my guess is that next year those numbers are going to bounce back up. But at the, at the moment, this is where they are. So for FY21, we're at a total of roughly 82,280. Um, just to remind everybody, and for anybody who happens to be listening out in the rest of the world, ADM stands for Average Daily Membership. It is a count of the students who are publicly funded, resident students who are publicly funded in a school district. And it's an average count over a 20 day period. If a student is publicly funded for 20 days, they are one ADM. If a student is in that district for only 15 of the days of that 20 day census period, then their ADM count is 0 0.75, three quarters. That's how, that's how it works. So we're saying ADM, it's, it's similar to a head count, but it's not a real head count. It's, it's an it's a, it's a average over 20 days. So what I did in column two, and I, I apologize, I just realized I did not number the columns. I'm gonna stop you for one second. Um, I, want, I think I just wanna make sure that we're looking at, everybody is aware of what the document is. And I think what I'm gonna do is Jesse ask you to bring it up. <laughs> I think we need to do that. Um, oh, Brad, I'm sorry, could you direct me to which document it is? It, it is the one that is titled, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Federal allocations, I think. Let me, I have it on my screen somewhere. Um, it is called Federal Allocations and Data, I believe. Version two. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Just a moment. That's right. I have it down at the bottom, too. I just realized that. 
So, so I just want to, um, Representative James, did you have a question? I do. Um, thanks, Chair Webb. Brad, um, in the second to the last column, Title I poverty ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so it, what, is, what is that stat exactly? That is the ratio of, uh, let me back up. When, when we receive information from the federal government for Title I, they send us counts of formula children, um, and that's kids in poverty. Um, and then they also send us counts of the population of that school district, and again, that LEA, again, our supervisory unions, and that's the, the, child, the students ages five through 17. And so what that ratio is, is the ratio of the formula kids against the, the, pop, the, uh, the total count. That's what it is. So in the case of the first line is Addison Central, it's 8.49%. Uh, that means that of those, the total five to 17 age population in that, in that district or that uh, supervisor union, uh, it, about eight and a half percent or fit, fit the de federal definition for poverty. So if we were to sort of back up and walk through through this, I think that, that we probably got a little bit lost in the process here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if we started back, let's go through column got by column. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Right. My apologies, I jumped ahead, which is normal for yeah. me. All okay. right, so, the, and, and again, I apologize, I did not number the columns, I should have. The first column is total of FY21 Title I allocation. Or, or, oh, no, Jesse, that's... Um, the other one. Yep, that's that's not that's 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 the initial one I sent out, I believe. There's a, I need there's to bear with me here. I'll, I'll get the other one right up. I think this this one should say version two at the end of it. What you're just seeing, what you're seeing, the individual titles. Yes, that's the one. Correct. And if you can make it a little larger, there we go. Can everybody see that one now? Thank you, Jesse. Okay, and, and Representative James, just, you know, the last column you were just asking is on the end of this one too, on the, the poverty ratio for Title I. Okay, so the very first column, total of FY21 title allocations, that is the combination by, by supervisory union of Title I, Title IIA, and Part IV, or Title IV, pardon me. Okay, that's, that's that sum for each. For the state as a whole, as a whole it's about 49.6, $49.7 million. The second column, Title II, or FY21, title allocations per ADM, that is just the first column divided by the FY21 ADM, which you'll see over to the right, the third column from the right, right? And that's, and so the statewide number is $604 per, per ADM. Everybody with me so far? And again, I apologize for not remembering the column. That's what it averages out to for the for the whole population, and and for the, as if the state were a single district. Yes, it's not. It is not the averages of those. It's, it's basically a weighted average for all practical purposes. It's the state as a whole. Representative Brady. Thanks. I just want to make sure I'm super clear that when we look at those uh, title allocations, that has nothing to do with COVID. Those would have been there this year, regardless of yes. what we're talking about. Okay. Thanks. That's correct. That's correct. So these are the ongoing funds. These yes. are not one-time funds. These are ongoing funds that district that are available to school, school districts um, based on their their title numbers. That's correct. Okay. Other other questions at the moment. And again, that that first that first sheet, which I'll be happy to send out to everybody, just broke the titles out individually. That that Jesse had up. So then the third column says total of ESSER and CRF amounts. These are the relief funds that came from the two first two relief acts, um, CARES and CRSA, CRSA, or whatever the acronym is for it. Um, so it, it consists of the coronavirus relief fund money, which which was set to expire on December 30th, at the end of December 30th, 2020. And then on December 27th, I think it was, Congress passed that legislation, I believe it was signed, and then it was extended for about another year, the, the use of CRF money. Most of it was used up at, 
the beginning because people knew that there was a deadline with it. Um, then this also has ESSER 1, which came out of the CARES Act along with the CARES money. Um, and then it has ESSER 2 in there too, which, is just, which has not been released to the school districts yet. Um, I'll come back to that in just a second. ESSER 1 was used mostly by, is being used mostly by school districts after they use their CRF money because CRF money was a little bit more restrictive in what its uses were for. And it, it had a, a, a deadline that was sooner than the ESSER 1 monies. ESSER, ESSER 1, I'm trying to remember how much money that was now. Um, I believe that was around just just under $30 million, I think, to the school districts, 29, something like that. Um, that that money um, is, 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 the ESSER money is a little bit more flexible what it can be used for. Uh, it's a quite a bit more flexible than what it can be used for. Um, so a lot of districts, from my understanding is that they were using some of it to backfill some of the CRF monies that were going to expire on December 30th. And so like if they hired a teacher with CRF money for the first half their, or a staff member of some sort, they were gonna pay that person with ESSER one money the second half of the semester. I'm not, again, I don't necessarily know everything that they're using the ESSER money for, but people are taking that money now and using it. Stop, that's falling. Oh, as ESSER, ESSER two, it came out in the, with the, the second relief act. Um, and that to school districts is, around $126 million, I think, off the top of my head. Um, we are, we being the agency, are looking at um, some type of um, recovery plans for school districts, I'm hoping to use some of that money for that, which I believe a lot of school districts think of my understanding, and I'm not part of these discussions, so I can't speak well about, much about them. But my understanding is that a lot of it will be used for summer schools. Um, getting kids back up to speed, looking at special education needs as time progresses and schools start to open again, they're going to find out what the kids need. I think they're gonna, I think the, the idea is to use a lot of these ESSER two monies to really focus on that. Um, I believe that the agency will be coming out with a broad plan in the next couple of weeks. That's my understanding. Again, I'm not part of the conversation, so I don't really know for a fact, but that's what I've heard um, from, from folks in, in the agency. So that column that says um, total investor and CRF amounts, that's almost $204 million. It's a significant amount of money. Um, the, and again, when you divide by the average daily membership, uh, you, you come out with, a, in round numbers, roughly $2,500 per pupil. That's, that's how much each SU has per, per, I shouldn't say per pupil, I apologize, per ADM. Um, it's, it's analogous to a, per, a pupil, but not exactly the same. So that's kind of giving you a rough idea of, of what, what each district is getting. Okay, I'm going to stop you for, for just one second. So, and then I know we have a couple of questions. I, I have one first. Um, so as we're looking at, at, this, at this, this document, we're seeing that we have Title I funds, which are ongoing, and we can see in the last column that on an ongoing basis, um, these school districts have access to Title I funds. And on a one-time basis, they have access to the funds in the, uh, in the ESSER and CRF. Yes. Um, the other one was a little bit handier for me because it, it broke it down into the different categories, which, which I appreciated. But if, if we were to look at this, we would see, let's go down to say um, Essex Westford, school district in uh, you, uh, 51, if I'm to understand this, that district that has uh, 3,725 ADM received, will, is, should receive 5.2 million, and that yes. will end up being approximately based on the whole ADM for, for this year between Title I and federal and, and the one-time funds, $1,300, $1,400 per student. Then if we look up at Essex North, that district, given the same ratios, will receive uh, $3,800 per ADM. So for this year, when you combine the Title I, and the one-time funds, they have that available for probably the next couple of years. 
Yes, the 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 uh, again CRF was largely used. CRF was not formula driven, and I think I, I forgot to put this out there earlier. CRF was not formula driven. That was basically based on um, budgets that people said this is what we need to spend money on. Uh, you, you as a legislature um, and, and gave us X number of dollars out of the um, out of the CRF money to for the school districts, and they basically wrote budgets for that and have been you know adjusting their budgets as time has progressed. Both ESSER one, ESSER two, and what will become ESSER three with the new act that was signed just that was passed just I think yesterday. Um, those monies are formula driven into how much that goes out to each school district. Um, and they are based there. It's a it's a lump sum of money for Vermont, and the allocations are based on the percentage of Title One money each of the as SUs gets as a as a for, as a percentage of the state. Um, so if if an if an SU gets two percent of the state Title One money, it would get two percent of the ESSER amounts. Okay, whichever ESSER we're talking about. Thank you, um, Representative Ansel. I don't need to go first. Um, I just have a clarifying question if others want to jump in. Okay, um, Representative James. And then Yeah, uh -huh. um, I was just wondering, I know we haven't gotten to this column yet, but wondering how the poverty ratio is determined um, because that it seems a lot lower than percentages I'm used to seeing for like free and reduced lunch, for example. It's it's not it, in in another file that I sent out um, the 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 bigger file that th these data are pulled from. I actually have that information in the background. The free and reduced lunch numbers that we have are, are actually not the numbers that you'd see on that file either. What you would see are the poverty counts based on what statute tells us to do for the equalized pupil count, and it's a poverty ratio. and And those 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 data come from the Department of Children and Families. And it is, it is based on uh, the number of children ages six through 17 living with families in Vermont receiving nutritional ben benefits in Vermont. That's three squares Vermont. Um, so so, so it's, a, it's a different count than what we're seeing here. I don't know enough about poverty and how it's counted at either our level DCF's level or at the federal level to be able to tell you what the differences are between them. I do think in general though that the poverty ratio in Title I's are a little bit lower than what you're used to seeing in terms of um, the, the DCF data. Um, I, I don't know as I can speak to why that is. Representative Kornheiser. Thanks. Um, I appreciate that you don't know the details of the program that AOE is working on to sort of support learning loss. Um, but I just, my my memory of the ESSER and the CRF funds is that essentially school districts get to make the bulk of the decisions about how they spend them. Is that still true? That's correct. With the newer money coming out that just passed Congress, there there's more of a focus on uh, addressing learning loss. I think 20% I think just twenty percent of the ESSER three money is going to be dedicated towards learning loss, and the, we, we as as an agency with our with our reserve have that same um, uh, requirement to use twenty percent of that to, uh, towards learning loss. And so districts get to decide what that means to them on some level, still within specifications. And what you all are doing is is supportive guidance of some kind. That's yes, I believe okay. that's correct. Thank you. Representative Ansel, did you want to go down? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I just want to be sure I'm understanding the columns. And um, so the uh, I, I totally get the first two columns. That's, that's the baseline. Um, understand that. Um, I think I understand the next two, which is S, what you're calling ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, right? Yes, and CRF, yes. And CRF, so you've got two ESSERs in there. I, I'm dying to know what we're going to call the new one, but um, but by the way, ESSER three. ESSER three. That's going to be very yeah, confusing. I, I, was actually, I was actually looking at the uh, at, at a summary of the the new relief bill. They, they yeah. still call it ESSER. They still call it. Uh, so we've got we've got ESSER one and ESSER two in that third column, and then the next two columns add those together. 
the one to the fourth, the fifth column, yes, total allocation amounts, yes. Yeah. So what we have outstanding, though, is uh, ESSER 3 is not represented anywhere here. That's correct. Is that right? So if we're trying to understand how much uh, in the way of resources that school districts have and how it's distributed, um, we have two thirds of the story here, half the story. I, I would say probably half the story. I, I Again, based on the summary that I saw last night, and please don't hold me to this figure. It yeah. looked like the amount of money going, the amount of ESSER three money going to school districts after the, after we have our reserve held back to use for our purposes to help them. I, I want to say it's around $256 million. Okay. It, it's a sizable piece yeah. of money. So this, this is great and it's really interesting, but it's about half the story, um, my, my clumsy math. Um, and then finally, uh, the questions around the poverty ratio are really important. I don't know if this is the right setting to really delve into those, but um, as poverty becomes a more and more significant driver of how resources get allocated, it really does matter how we define it and that we understand it and have confidence in it. So I just say that, um, not asking for any um, uh, um, no, great insight about it, but I think it's a, I think it's important to have a discussion about it. What, what I what I will do, Representative Vance, is I will I will check into what. Um, what the federal definition of poverty is that they're using for Title I for these numbers that you're seeing on this. Um, and there's been some question um, on, on some of the DCF data also. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll look at right. that. I'm looking at that also. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Conlon. Uh, hopefully, mine just a, a quick clarifying question. If we move from the top statewide figure gray bar to the next district, which is Addison Central, and the column that is total of ESSER and CRF amounts, you took into account the formula that is applied to ESSER one and two, as opposed to just multiplying um, uh, ADM times the amount per ADM that was calculated in the bar above. Am I, yes. is that correct? Yes. Okay, okay. So the when you applied the ESSER amounts to each district, you used the, the ESSER formula, which is largely the title one formula. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The, the, and the, again, those those are in the background that you can't see in this yep. in this file. That, Thank you. I'd be happy to give you the big file. It just will be more information, which is probably That's better okay. because it's more detailed. <laughs> Representative Austin. Yes. Thank you. Um, I had the same questions that Representative Ansel had as well. I'm curious about. Um, you know, the definition of poverty and poverty ratio. I'm just wondering, the Title I funds bring, do they uh, bring um, students identified uh, as um, in the poverty range up, is it up to per pupil spending? I mean, what does that money add it to? What's, what's the, um, and the end point, what, what's it based on? It's, it, if that it, makes it is, sense. Yeah, it, it, is, it is supplemental to what the school district is choosing to spend for, on, on, for people. Now, you, you, when, when, when you usually hear about numbers from me on, on spending per pupil and things like that, what we're really talking about at that point, 99.9% .9 of the time is what's called education spending per equalized pupil. Education spending is a subset of the budget, and the budget is the base of the total amount of money the school district will be spending. Within that, when, when districts build budgets, they also, an expenditure budget, they also build a revenue budget. And within that revenue budget are dedicated revenues for certain things. And one of those are the title monies. We, they also get special education aid, they get transportation aid, they may get small schools grants, they may have tuitions coming in, they may have a surplus. There are lots of other little pots of money floating around. When you take all those pots of money, those, those revenues lumped together, I tend to call them offsetting revenues. When you take the, the offsetting revenues and subtract them from the overall budget total, you get what's called education spending, and that's in statute. 
education spending is the number that gets divided by equalized pupils and that drives people's tax rates. So um, to answer your question as, as to what, what the federal money is getting added on top of, um, I would think that it would be probably an amount, if you were to look at any single district, their education spending per equalized pupil, I would think it would be an amount higher than that because they have other monies in there exclusive of the federal monies. But basically, it's, it's on top of the money that they're, that they're spending from the state and from any local source that they happen to have. Um, it's, it's on top of that. I don't think there's a target that they're trying to uh, reach in terms of the, the amount of money they're spending per pupil. I think it's just they're looking at this is what we need to spend to mm -hmm. get this program, to get these kids up to speed, additional help for them, things like that. I don't think it's a target, though. I, I, I'm not an expert on it. Um, and so you probably want to talk to people in the field or perhaps other people at AOE if you really want more detailed information on that. Okay, thank you. Representative Kornheiser? No, um, Representative Durfee. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Brad, I'm wondering if you can just answer uh, this question for me. I'm looking at the, towards the top of the chart, two districts that are uh, next to each other, Benton, Rutland, and Burlington. Mm -hmm. And if I look at the column on the far right, I see that their poverty ratios are pretty similar, close to 15%. Uh, but then if I look back at the title allocations per ADM, uh, I see that Burlington is more than twice what Bennington Rutland has. So, yep. uh, so that's a big question one. And then the second question is, then I look at the next set of columns at the ESSER and CRF dollars and see that, that it's more like closer to three times uh, difference differential there between Burlington and Thank you, Rutland. So, uh, can you just quickly explain that? I, I, because I thought the poverty ratio. I thought I thought I heard you say the poverty ratio was driving the title numbers anyway, title dollars. But it looks like there's something else going on there. They they are, but but to to get into the real detail, I would have to go back and look at I, at each each of those, which I'll, I'll I won't say I'll be happy to do, but I'll be happy to do it for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I would I would need to delve into that and, and to see see what's going on. There's you know what basically what I did is I there, there's a hold harmless provision in there. I, I don't think that would account. I'm on the title section by the way. There's in Title One. There's a hold harmless provision in there. I don't think that would account for that much of a difference. That roughly doubling factor that you're seeing there. But I I would have to look in, into it individually you know, at each of those and see what's happening in the calculation itself. And then that calculation, whatever it happens in, in Title One, actually carries over to Title Four, because the Title Four allocation is actually based on the Title One allocation. Um, it's, there's a different amount, but it's based on that percentage. And then Title Two um, is based on um, it's it's a little bit different. It's based on eighty percent of of eighty percent is based on poverty. Twenty percent is based on enrollment. So that's going to factor into it too. Um, but again, I, I would have to go in and, and look and see what's happened at each one to give you a real explanation for it. Oh, okay, uh, Th thanks. It, 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 but in, in, in terms of the the ESSER and CRF monies, I should say ESSERs and CRF money, um, a lot of that is depending on what they chose and what they asked for in CRF. Um, Burlington asked for a significant amount in CRF. I don't recall what Bennington Rutland asked for, but my guess is it probably wasn't as much as Burlington was. So that, that would impact that. Plus the, uh, the ratios that are, are slightly different in terms of title one percentage as the state of a whole state, but percentage as a state of the state as a whole. I'm gonna try English here. So I'll, I'll, have to look, I'll have to look into those representative I think it's also important to look at the FY21 ADM and just see that that also this is based on different calculations of, of what the ADM is. Burlington Thank having. You. Good having point. I, I completely missed that one too. Yes. Yeah. So we, we ended up you know looking at it by ADM, though that's not how money is distributed. It's distributed by the formula. Then we just looked at, we looked at then. Um, we asked Brad to look at then how does that compare you know, per 80. Right. 
And and that's that's th th thank you, Representative Webb, because I completely spaced out on that one. I, sh I should have known that right away, first of all. Um, but that's not quite a, 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 dub a doubling in, in Burlington over Burlington Rutland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there other questions at this point? Or um, Brad, do you want to keep moving along? <laughs> Sure, sure. <laughs> and, and again, I don't mind being interrupted at any time, so that's fine. So we did we did the, the total of titles and the titles per ADM. We then did the total of ESSERs and CRF and then per ADM. And then that last column is basically the total of the two. Um, the, there, there are slight rounding differences in there, so things aren't going to add up exactly right. But the total, it's, instead of saying total allocation amounts, it probably should have said total federal amounts. That would probably have been clear as to what I meant right there. But that that is all the titles and all the the, the uh, ESSERs and ESSER one and two and the CRF monies added together, and then um, then again divided by the ADM count from FY twenty one. So Battenkill, for example, got a little over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, with a population ADM of about 400 students. Yep. And if we add that up, basically what the district got per, per student um, was about $3,000 per student. Uh, yes. Burlington received a little, almost 15 million with a total population of 3581, um, which adds up to about $4,800 per student. Yes, and I, and I, you know, I'm looking at something that is the, the if, if you were to count columns one, total of title one allocation or title allocations and column three, total of ESSER and CRF, and compare that to the allocate, total allocation, they're not exactly adding up the same as they should be. They're close, but it's bothering me now because I should not have made that should, I should have checked that and apparently did not. So I will probably, I will look at this file a little more closely and revise it because I'm just looking at the last, if we look up at Addison Central, the very first one, it ends in 144 in the first column. The third column ends in 124. That should add up to 868. And it, that's not what I'm seeing as the last three digits in the total allocation column. I don't know what I did. I will need to check that. Um, the numbers are close, but they're not exact. And that is not good. And I apologize. Thank you. But, but the, I, I, think, I think we're still in the same general, you were in the same area. Um, so we could have the same discussion. It's just, I will make sure, I will update these numbers and figure out what I did incorrectly, something. Thank you, Representative Kornheiser. Thanks. Um, am I hearing you correctly that um, for some of this money, it wasn't necessarily about what communities were sort of technically do, but the how much they were able to ask for? Yes, the CRF money was what what the school districts, I, sh I should say it was at the SU level, but it's based mm -hmm. on the school districts, what they thought they needed. That, that's what it was. And, and, okay. and it, that, it, was, it was a fairly wide range. And sort of connected on some level to their capacity to request. Probably. Okay. Uh, but the ESSER just goes out automatically regardless of requests or paperwork? Okay. Yes. Great, yes. thank you. It's for me. Okay. Yeah. So in some ways, I, I kind of liked it better when you broke up the ESSER and the CCRF, personally. <laughs> well, um, you, you, could, you could have Jesse pull that other one up, yeah. um, which has, has, has totals. Uh, it, I don't think I broke, I did not break them out um, per pupil. But uh, if you want to see the totals, Jesse could bring that other one up that she had up initially. It had the two yellow yeah. columns in it, Jesse. I don't know if Joe would like that or not. That one was, was a little easier to follow, I <laughs> found. Sure. Um, Representative Austin and then Brady. Yep. Was the um, three point plus million dollars that we allocated to Burlington High School for the renovation for their move, is that in this amount? No. That that came out, out of the state reserve that we set aside. Um, the, the federal law 
allowed us to set aside 10% of the ESSER monies. Um, and that's what we did and it came out of that. Thank you. Representative Brady. Thanks. Well, I answered my first question because I found, yeah, how much was the CRF, the part that was maybe a little bit more arbitrary in terms of how much districts got. Mm -hmm. But I also just, um, I, I guess I'm, it's sort of a question more for the, the members here. I think we have to be a little careful about talking about total federal dollars coming in to make sure that we peel the existing title funds out of that, that we should be talking about CRF, SR1, SR2, and now SR3 when we talk about this massive, which is still, it's massive, but that it, this massive influx of an investment and dollars into schools, it seems a little conflated to me to put title monies in that because those are monies they would have had regardless and needs that exist regardless. But, but maybe I'm, I'm reading something wrong there. No, that's what that is. You were exactly right. That is what I did. Um, I, I put all the federal monies together in that one column, um, rightly or wrongly. That's what I did. Um, and what, what just quick, quick segue, what you're looking at right now is basically the same data, except for whatever mathematical mistake I made in the background. Um, but it, what it's showing is it's showing the individual title amounts for Title One, Two, A, and Four. Um, in the first three columns, and it shows what people requested to, to address Representative Kornheiser's question for CRF, and then it shows ESSER 1, and then it shows ESSER 2. So those, and again, we don't have ESSER 3 information yet. And then, the to, then they have the total allocation, which is addressing your, your question, Representative Brady. I could easily break that out and show, show it separately with the total of the titles and the total of the relief funds. I think it's here. I just think we have to be careful about which column when we're talking mm -hmm. about new federal dollars, which column we're, we're using. I think we can take a look at this and break it out a little bit differently and, and ask Brad to, 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 to differentiate that a little bit more so we can get the sort of sense of what the ongoing monies are and the uh, one-time funds. Sure. That might be helpful. Um, Emily, is that a new hand? Yeah, sorry, one, one final question here. Yeah. Um, Brad, do you know when you will um, have numbers on SR3? I know it hasn't even been quite signed yet, but I know our staff is sort of working furiously to try to find their way through and um, not trying to rush you, just trying to have a sense of when we'll have that information. I, I think I think as, as soon as we know officially what our what our allocation is coming to Vermont, I, I can do it within two minutes after that. Um, so, I mean, again, I. I I believe it's around $256 million, if, if my memory served me correctly. Um, I think one way of thinking about it is ESSER 2 is giving each SU roughly four times what they got from ESSER 1. And ESSER 3 is rough, roughly double ESSER 2. So ESSER 3 about eight times what they got in, in ESSER 1. So just as, just as rough estimates for people. But as, but as soon as we get the final numbers, I, I can do the numbers quickly. Thanks. Brad, I, I think we heard from the secretary last year uh, in a, a meeting that there were Title I funds that were being returned to the federal government because they had not been spent. And I think we also heard from school districts that they sometimes have problems because they're working on their contracts for personnel, uh, but don't necessarily find out their Title I until July. I'm wondering, and when we have had uh, folks in our room that work on a national level, their eyebrows raise when we hear, they hear that federal funds are being returned. Do you have any uh, understanding of why and how much money we are returning? And then again, what we can do so that we are not doing that? I, I don't. I think I can address the why. I think you need to talk to people in in the field who have, have had to return money. Um, I, I don't I don't think I can do that and do it justice. Um, the federal money does have a time period. You know, you get it for one year, and then there's with the tidings and that's it. I think it's good for I want to say three years. Um, and so, what our business office does is, anytime a request comes in for reimbursement for using Title One as an example. Um, they will take that, take that request reimbursement and use the oldest money first. 
So they're so they're, they're, that that's what they're doing. So they're trying to ensure that no money is going back. There seems to be a backlog. I did ask the question um, of our business office roughly how much is going back on an annual basis. They said not a lot, so probably maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. I haven't gotten a final figure, but I think that would be probably more than is what's really going back. Um, but our business office is very good about using the oldest money first. Um, they make that a priority. We have reached out, I think it was back in the summer, maybe, maybe it was summertime, but some, sometime during this COVID time. We did try to put information together to help, um, to help school districts see what different sources of federal fund dollars they had exclusive of the, of the ESSER money and the CRF money um, and, and how what they could be used for it. So it's kind of compiled into a certain place. And, and it was pointed out to them that, you know, old money needs to be used. But to really address why it's not getting used up right away, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I can't address that and, and say that I'm right. Thank you. Um, Representative Kornheiser. Sorry, Sorsha lowers our hands for us and I'm spoiled now and I keep on oh. <laughs> Okay, Brad, was there more? Um, I don't, I think in, ter in terms of the, the federal monies, I think that's pretty much what I had to say. Um, I will, and again, as I said, I apologize for making some crazy mathematical error in there. And I'll figure out what I did wrong um, and, and have that corrected and get that posted by Jesse and send it out to you all. Um, one of the things that I was going to talk about in Ways and Means the other day, and then Representative Vance will ask me to postpone it, was the um, update on school budgets in terms of spending and such. You heard from Sue Siglowski how the budget votes themselves went. If Representative Vance would like me to, I'll be happy to, to talk about that, what, yeah. where, where we stand in terms of education spending at that time. That would I be great. Be good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and, great. and this, this is what feeds into what Mark and Brianna are working on that, that hopefully they'll have tomorrow. They want to check the numbers out and make sure that they were right um, in, in terms of the education, because these numbers go into the education fund, education spending. Um, Jesse, would you bring up the one? Before, we, does, oh, before we take that down, though, I, I wanted to, uh, Representative Elder and then Representative Williams. Oh, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I just put my hand up, Brad. Yeah, I, I before we moved on, I just wanted to um, speak to this, the poverty weights in Title I, which has already been spoken to uh, in ways that I agree with, but just to see if I can summarize it and see if I've, I've got it right. We measure poverty in several different ways. Um, I, it, in school districts, of course, the free and reduced lunch is something where we see eligibility drives. And so that's one thing. Uh, for our equalized pupil weights, that poverty weight is not based off free and reduced, which actually was a misconception I previously had, and I know some of our school yeah. administrations had. Um, that is based on the DCF number. Um, and that would be in Vermont statute should the legislature choose to, to change that to be the, uh, to go off, say, free and reduced. Th those happen to have the same eligibility, you know, three squares and free and reduced, but a different application. Um, that, as I understand it, we could change. Finally, there's this Title I, which as I understand it is similar to the DCF number, but maybe with some other elements. Uh, and so that's one question. Is the Title I number really the same as the DCF number you get for equalized? That, that's kind of question one. And then question two is, is there anything statutorily at the state level that can be done to change Title I? Because it would seem that that Title I allocation is probably not just derived from Vermont statute in the way that our equalized pupil weight is. So that's kind of three different ways of measuring poverty, and I'm just trying to see if I'm understanding the distinctions. Yeah, I, I would I would say that Title I and the DCF numbers are not the same. Um, I, I did take a look at those, and, and there's there's significant difference in places. Why I don't know, but they're they're not the same. Um, I, do, I again, as I said, I don't really know. I think it comes out of U.S. Census data where the poverty numbers come from from Title I from the federal folks. Um, I will have to check in that and ask guys. I, I imagine somebody in our agency probably knows that, um, and I'll check with them first. Otherwise, I'll be in touch with the feds and ask them. Um, secondly, no, there is nothing we can do uh, uh, at, at the Vermont level to change the what, what the federal folks are doing with their Title I properties. I'm going out on a limb here because I'm not an attorney by any means, but, it, but, that, but that's federal law, and, and we can't do anything about that. It's written into legislation at the federal level. 
and just a tiny quick follow up. So the first two, though, the the um, we could choose to unify the way we count poverty for our uh, poverty weight in our equalized yes. pupil, and we could choose yes, to yes. unify that with um, food service eligibility rather than three squares. That that is a choice we could make is to unify those two. Is that right? Yes, I think that is correct, and I think you would want to look into how FRL is is done um, because in some cases, you know, if there's a certain number of kids, I can't remember what it is, maybe forty percent, uh, in in a, in a school district that are eligible, then the whole school becomes eligible. So I, I you know, it, you, you, I think you need to look into it. But yes, I think you can do that if you so choose. Representative Williams. Yes, um, I'm sorry. This is just a housekeeping. Uh, that I thought I'd like to help Brad out with why his math didn't add up. If you look at the previous chart, and if you add uh, the money columns one plus three plus six, you get column five. Somehow column six got thrown in there. Just thought I'd give you some time. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. I, I did it. I did it quickly, and 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 I normally go back and check things, and I did not on that one. No uh, problem. So thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Representative Beck. Yeah, Brad, regarding the um, the Title I measurement for poverty that the federal government uses, do they in any way factor in the cost of living um, in a different location, different locations in there? Um, I'm 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 not I'm not 100 certain, Representative Beck. I'm I, I, Title One does have some fun some different things in there. It's it, the Title One allocation acts. It comes from four different formulas that get uh, yeah. aggregated together to make the total allocation. And I, I I'll I'll have to go in and, and look carefully at what those four are. I do I have it written down somewhere. I thought it was too much information to send out for this, but I, I'll dig that out and then look. Okay, and the um the same I had the same question for. Um, the the poverty measurement that is used to determine equalized pupil weighting as well. I don't think we include cost of living in that calculation, but um, I'm just curious. Not not in the equalized pupil calculation itself. Okay. In terms of what DCF is doing in the county, I, I don't think they do either. I think yeah. It's just an actual count of who's living in families who receiving three schools. Okay, yeah, that was my question about it. if DCF sensitizes for cost of living at all in there. I, I, not to my knowledge. Okay. Okay, Brad. <laughs> and you want to continue? <laughs> Glad. I thought, thought there were going to be other people on this one besides me. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, okay. So, so are, are there any other questions on this before we kind of switch gears and, and go to um, what, what what I've seen for preliminary preliminary budget data? I think we can move forward. Okay. So, so Jesse, it's the one that says preliminary budget. It's called um, FY22 pre-budget, then 030921. It looks like that. Thank you, Brad. That's it. Thank you. Um, so ways and means has been is used to seeing this this sheet. Um, so if they will um, humor me for a moment, I'll kind of give a very quick um, overview of it to, to House Ed, because I don't think you have, all have seen this before. What this is is a summary of preliminary budget data that, that comes in. We ask school districts, once they have a board approved school a budget for FY22 or whatever year we're talking about, to send in that data to us so that we can get a rough idea of what the demand is going to be on the education fund for coming up. If you recall, if I recall, um, back for the December 1 letter, I think we had a, I had an estimate in there for a spending increase, I want to say of 3.49%, I think. Maybe someone remembers, I don't off the top of my head. But it had well, a 3.8 in the tax letter. Okay, 3.8, okay. 3 .8 Thank text. you. Um, so that, that, that was based on what, uh, that, that number for the December 1 letter was based on what business manager told me they thought was going to happen at that point. So it's, it's an estimate. 
Um, once again, then we ask people to send in their information once they have a preliminary budget. And at this point, the number of budgets we're expecting is right there at the top is about 117. I think that's counted two of the unorganized housing wars, but you know, we have received 92, just over 92% of the preliminary budgets as of today, or as of what's the date? Today's the 11th, I think, as of two days ago, as of the 9th. Um, so what you're seeing in these kind of slightly yellowish sections are just what happened on the 10th of February, the 18th of February, and then the 25th of February. So it's, I'm just showing kind of a history. So if you just scroll down to the very last one, please, Jesse, where it says, yep, that one, the brighter one. Uh, oh, the, the, I'm, I was about to point at my computer screen, but that won't help anybody. Um, the one that says March 9th, 21. So the first thing is we have 108 districts reporting. And that's out of 117. That's why, where that 92% of reporting comes in. Um, the part that we really care about is red, where it says initial education spending. Of those, of those 108 districts that are submitted data, we they have education spending. That's the number that goes into the education fund of 1.34 billion with a B dollars. Okay, in if you look right across to the right where it says same in FY21, everybody see that one? It's in black right at the end of the red. If you go down to the initial education spending, you'll see the number 11323, one, three, three, blah, blah, blah. Um, that is how much money those, how much education spending those same 108 school districts had in FY21. So it was 1.32 billion, it's now 1.34 billion. That's a 1.29% increase in education spending. The December 1 letter was based on, as Representative Beck said, 3.8%. Um, it's, coming, it's coming in significantly lower. You can, the, the, the two just above the expenditures and the offsetting revenues, the expenditures, you can see that they're up two and a half percent over FY21. So 1.66 versus 1.62. Offsetting revenues though, are up almost 8%. And you can see that it's 322 million this year or as reported by the 108 versus 299 million for the same districts last year. I think what's happening is a lot of districts have had money left over at the end of FY20 and did not, instead of rolling it and covering it with CRF monies like we thought they were going to do and rolling it forward to offset the FY21 education fund as, as you put in legislation, they just kept it as a surplus and are using it in FY22. So it looks, my guess is, and I don't know this for a fact because I haven't really talked to business managers and nor really seen the data. My guess is it's probably a one-time, they're, they're using kind of one-time money to really suppress things down because of what everybody thought was gonna happen with the education fund. Subsequently to, to that December 1 letter, the, the education fund revenues came, came out much more favorably. Um, and again, that's what Mark and Brianna will talk about when they, when they come, when they have an updated balance sheet. And I believe they incorporated this number into it, plus the estimates of what those who did not report. So all in all, it's, it's much more favorable than the December 1 letter. And as Sue Sikolowski said earlier on, I think you all coming out early, um, passing the, the, the bill out of the House Ways and Means Committee saying that we think that the education fund is much healthier than we anticipated back on December 1, um, and that the yield is, is much higher, which drives down tax rates for, if everything else is equal, that I think that that did a lot to getting all but three budgets passing so far. Um, and one of them, I know the big one very was close from what, what uh, the business manager told me, it was, it was close. But. So I think I think the news here is that that um, that districts were listening. They did have money left over, I believe. And again, I, need, I don't know that for a fact, but I think is they did have money left over from FY20 that they're using to push down their FY22 education spending. And that's why we're seeing a a, a lower increase of 1.29% as opposed to what we anticipate, what we estimated of 3.8% earlier. Thank you. Just to uh, be clear um, in terms of the difference between the Title I funds and the ESSER funds on, on the information that we're looking at here, Title I funds uh, have to supplement, not supplant. However, ESSER funds could have resulted in doing so here. 
They, yes, they could have. Um, but I don't, I don't think, and I, there, there's actually a business manager meeting tomorrow. Um, and if I have time, I'll sit in on that and I can ask this question. I don't think many of them put ESSER funds into their budgets at this point. Um, and the reason I say that is because really what most of them have right now, they don't have any ESSER two money because we have not put out applications for that yet. They may be anticipating that put in their budgets um, and it's possible that's in there, but but I, I'd be a little surprised if it was, uh, but I, I'll, I'll ask them and find out. If that money isn't there, then yes, you, you're quite correct, Re Representative Webb, that is also pushing the education spending down. Representative Kornheiser. And then similarly, CRF money could have supplanted spending from last year's budget that rolled over into this year? It could, yes. Okay, even though the CRF was spent, thanks. Representative Austin? Yes, um, thank you, Chair Webb. I'm just wondering, Brett, if you know what the anticipated COLA percent will be in FY22. I don't, I don't. You don't, okay, thank you. Representative Conlon. Uh, yeah, just from a school board member perspective, um, Brad's take on it is exactly right. There was a lot of leftover money uh, at least in our district, we applied a fair portion of that to keep our per pupil spending down, um, which resulted in less pressure on the ed fund. Uh, and a lot of those surpluses uh, were, I'm not sure ESSER really played a role, CRF probably did, and then even more so um, just the lack of school activities from March to the end of the school year. That, that's, that's what I've heard too, Representative Collins. You know, you know your district quite well. Okay. I'm not seeing other questions. And I think that's the last document that you were gonna to show today. Brad, is that correct? I, I believe so, yes. Thank you. Um, I know that we are gonna to wanna to take a look at your document again, have a little bit better understanding of just the title funds mm -hmm. and just the ESSER funds and how that how that breaks down um, rather than a, a total, which I had I had actually asked you to do, but I realized that's not as helpful as breaking it down. Um, sure, no, I, I can do that easily. Yeah. Mathematically correctly this time too. And it sounds like um, folks are interested in finding out a little bit more about how Title I is calculated. And we can certainly do that. And Jesse, I'll talk with you later about um, getting someone from AOE, uh, or it may be AHS, to help us understand how that's allocated, at least in our committee. <laughs> so, Representative Ansel. Are you, are you ready, ready to dismiss us? I think we are. Uh, great. So, uh, uh, really helpful information, and I'm glad that we had a chance to look at it together because this, this movement of all this federal money is... Um, it, it's a it's pretty significant and important to uh, begin to get a handle on it. So to ways and means, if you could gather in, oh, I don't know, 10 minutes, um, 10 minute breaks. So uh, 10, of, 10 of 11, um, that would be great. See you, see you all then, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. So Ed Committee, um, we have the next group is on at 1110. Um, so I think we can wait until then. Um, is there anything in, in terms of additional data that we would want in looking at this with Brad, uh, this data? Uh, if you want to state what you're looking for, you can do it now or um, email me. And we'll organize that information. Representative Brady. I think that, I mean, it's already been said, but I think understanding the poverty calculations is, is really important, not, not just for this, but for so much of our work. Yeah. And then I think second to like what you offered there, um, Peter, is, is helpful, but to have a, if there's a sense statewide more, how much, how much was you know, saved, how much was driving down tax rates in the current year, kind of, so basically how much is still there to be spent? It's a, you know, I, I don't know how, to what extent we can even 
know that, but um, I'd love to have a sense of what you know about your district more across the state. Representative Conlon? Yeah, I, I think you're right, um, Aaron, that it would take a, a survey of every district individually to see how much of their surplus they applied, how much they might have moved into a reserve account. Um, and I didn't raise my hand to respond, but I, I do. I, but actually, I do want to respond to something else uh, Representative Brady said earlier, and that is um, sort of moving the discussion about title money to the side, um, since that that happens regardless of COVID or not. I, I guess I, I agree with that. Um, sort of moving in that direction as well. Excellent. So Brad, you've got those. Um, Jesse, we'll, we'll find out a little bit more about um, how it's calculated. Um, and I think with that, we can take a little break until 11.10, correct, Jesse? Is that right? That's exactly right, Tara. Okay. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, this is really interesting. And even though that, you know, it's not 100% um, down to the penny, it's, it, it gives us a sense of what's going on. And I think that that's most helpful to us is really to have sort of a broad sense. Yeah, so, yeah no, no, no problem. And, and thank you, and sorry, thank you for representing for finding out what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Excel um, sheet. It's always the Excel sheet. Yeah, there's always something. Um, yeah. um, I, I pride myself on numbers, but I guess not anymore. Um, so, <laughs> so what, what I, 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 thanks. I think I think maybe what I'll do for you, if it, it would help, is I, it sounds like people still want to see the title numbers, or we can just ignore them entirely. Right? Your call. But what I was thinking of doing is having, like I showed you on that last one, the three columns of those three titles, and then yeah. a total, and then a, a, a per ADM for that. And then the three, the three federal monies, the CRF, the ESSER one and two, and then a total and the and, and a money and uh, an ADM per ADM on that. If, if that would be helpful, is that what you'd like to see, or is that still too much? Do I get some of the CR, some of the CRF was applied to FY twenty, correct? Um, yeah, and most of it. Well. It's hard to say because I haven't seen numbers and, and I'm not sure that yeah. budgets are being compiled on an Excel sheet so that I can actually pull yeah. the information. I think it's coming in as, as um, PDFs or backup da documentation on requests. Um, but I think I think a, a significant amount of it was used in FY20, but I think a, also a significant amount was used in FY21. What what percentages, I don't know. I could probably check with business manager to see, but I bet it's, I bet it's gonna be across the board and very, as, as Representative Collins said, for any information from district by district by district. Yeah, yeah. Representative Austin? Yes, I'm just um, wondering, in the waiting study report, were the Title I funds uh, included in that calculation of poverty rates and uh, weights? I don't recall. I have asked her that question. I have asked her that question and she said, yes, I'm not sure where it is, but she has said yes. And I, I actually am gonna follow up with, with Tammy Colby. Okay, I figure you probably had asked that representative Webb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just never saw how it, how it was handled. Um, but do you remember Representative Conlon? Oh, uh, no, I just know that I know that you did ask the question. Yeah, I actually just had it. I was just want to do while we have Brad here taking advantage of it. Um, I'm just continue to be amazed at the amount of money that's about to be directed to um, schools. And, you know, the ESSER two is, is a significant windfall for districts. Um, and now we've got an ESSER three coming down the pike and uh, just, you know, wondering, um, is the AOE sort of providing some sort of um, expertise to these districts, especially the smaller ones, in terms of how to handle it, how to account for it, uh, all of that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very timely question. Um, and I think that's what the, the response group is, or uh, um, what term, I forgot the term now, but the, um, the response, <laughs> And it begins on R. Um, the the group that's working on what to use these monies for recovery for you know um, the students who have lost quite a bit of their their abilities and such um, to to re 
make make headway with them. I think that's the idea. I don't think we have, at, at this point, at, to the best of my knowledge, we've not come out with anything without guidance. I think we're going to. I do not know how detailed it will be. I do not know if it will just be broad terms. Um, I think one of the things that went out was an overall request for, for school districts to come up with a recovery plan. Um, I'm not sure how much detail was asked for that or if there's any guidance on what the recovery plan should call. Again, I, I, I'm not completing ignorance, although it's true. Um, I'm not part of those discussions. I don't know really what's going on. It, it, it would, it's easier to know when we're all in one building every day. We're not. Um, I happen to be here today, but I'm about one of two people. Uh, maybe three. So, so I, I, I just don't overhear conversations like I used to. So I'm not 100% sure. I, I can find someone to talk to you about that if you'd like. Um, but I don't know if, if the agency as a whole is ready to roll it out or not at this point. So our right. school districts are, much, are, are very experienced in what to do when there really isn't enough money. <laughs> <laughs> they spend a lot of time trying to do less with more. Yes. Are our school districts going to need some kind of technical support? Uh, I'm thinking about some of our districts that are all of a sudden uh, have the availability of an influx of one-time money. Are they going to need technical support on how to address that? Well, um, probably, um, but, I, but I would say that everybody has to remember this is not just free money to use for any purpose. It all has to be COVID-19 related. Um, I think sometimes people forget that in the conversations that I hear or there, it's not being stated clearly. Um, but it, it has to somehow be related to COVID-19 and response. I don't, and again, I, the Esther 2 money was not really opened up any differently than the Esther 1 money. They, they kind of clarified a few things, but they did not expand it or narrow it really. Um, I don't know what is going to happen in this new Esther 3 money, whether they're changing anything. What I saw and kind of the, it was an overview from the CCSSO, um, Chief Counsel of School State Officers, or whatever that stands for, the secretaries throughout the, the country of education. Um, it, it, it didn't talk about Esther 3 being able to be used for other purposes. Um, but Esther, Esther, Esther funds can be used for interrupted learning. Yes, they can, and clarify. I think I think that's the idea um, is is to use it for that. I just yeah, I just I just want to make sure that people are aware that it, it has to be it, the interrupted learning is because of COVID, no question about it. Um, is, uh, so it can it can be certainly be used for that, um, but it's just it's not you know I think some people think that there's a lot of money coming, we can use it for this that. You know, I think that's not quite the case. Representative Brady. Is Ted Fisher our, our one to ask in terms of once we get the details on how the money can and cannot be used, what the rules are around it? It just seems like we might need a, a bit more info coming from him and in our updates about what it can be used for, what kind of advice, restrictions, assistance is being sent out to schools. He's being pulled back into the agency to deal with the next level, but we do have um, okay. Mark, Perot in, Mark Perot in the room um, who will certainly work okay. with, with yeah, I, I, the agency. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure Ted's the one for how the money can be used. I think okay. that's more the, the folks in the area who are, who are dealing with Esser. Um, and I, you know, I, it, it, that's fallen under Ann Borden there and Jesse Royce. They do the federal programs. It's kind of fallen under their wheelhouse. Um, I, my wheelhouse happened to be the CRF money. Um, I, I think Ted would probably have an idea of what the recovery plan might be when it's coming yeah. out. Um, I think Ann would probably have an idea also. Um, so. But we and I wonder if we, what, well, I wonder if we'll want to hear from either VSA or VSBA about capacity to deal with a disparate capacity in different types or sizes of districts, um, kind of what their, their sense of it is. They, even if it's just anecdotal, I'm guessing they kind of have a sense of what may happen. That's a really good point. And um, we will be posing that to Sue Soglowski. She's not, in, and, and the school board, the, the superintendents, they're not in the room at the moment. We are losing um, our access to TED um, we're just going to be going, Jesse will be working on uh, working with the agency and the agency will figure out who will provide testimony uh, on the issues. Um, and if folks wouldn't mind um, emailing some of those questions to me, 
so I don't have to try to find them again. I would really appreciate it. It will deal with my failing memory. Um, Representative James. Thanks. Um, you know what I have lost track of? Um, for ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3, and CRF, um, I, I would love a cheat sheet, and maybe, Brad, this is in some of the stuff you sent today about um, when the funds have to be spent by, um, when they'll be kind of hitting the districts. I, I was surprised to kind of be reminded that the ESSER 2 money isn't even available yet, right? So I've, I, I could really use for all four of those funds just a little, you know, here's the name of the fund, here's what it's in general uh, can be used for, here's when districts will have it, here's how it's gonna be, here's who's gonna decide and what that deadline is for spending. Um, or, yeah, that, I, that's I really not a problem. I, I'm not sending anything like that out um, at, the, at this point, but I, but I can do that. Um, I know that's 101, but I've, I've lost track of that. Uh, I have to, it's, it's changed, it's, uh, I have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do, I, I can say that the ESSER money, well, I think I could say, I think the ESSER monies are good until September, ESSER 1, until September 30th of 2022, I think. I think ESSER 2 is, goes out another year, but I'll, I'll, I'll get that information and send it to you. That's what I remember too, 923. We've, we've, a lot of our bills are adjusted based on that. <laughs> so I think if there isn't anything else, we can take a little break. Please email your, um, your questions uh, about this so that we can get them in one place um, and not in my brain. Uh, we appreciate that better resource. And with that, we can go offline and take a break and come back. At